Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the Boston Historic Catholic Records Project. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Director of Education and Online Programs here at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I will be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. And giving today's presentation is Jean McGuire, Library Director at NEHGS. She is responsible for overseeing the Society's library and special collections, including patron services, our collection de development, access and preservation, and the Society's volunteer program. Jean joined the NEHGS staff in 1999 after receiving her master's in library and information science from Simmons College. She is also our liaison with the Archdiocese of Boston Archives and was instrumental in really developing the partnership between NEHGS and the Archdiocese, which we'll be discussing today. So today's presentation will last for about an hour, including time for question and answer. Uh, Jean will first give you a snapshot of the history of Catholics in Math Massachusetts, and then discuss our digitization project, its scope, how to access the records, what's currently available, and what will be available soon. At any time during the presentation, feel free to write a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Jean will answer as many as she can in the time provided. There is no handout for today's presentation, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation. So don't worry if you don't get everything in your notes today, you will be able to go back and review the content. We also just posted a subject guide to researching New England Catholic records on our website, and we'll share that link at the end and include that link in our follow-up email to you as well. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Jean. Thank you, Ginevra. Welcome, everyone. It's fantastic to see such a large number of people sign up for this webinar. We're really excited about this project here at NEHGS, so it's nice to think that uh, that excitement is contagious and a lot of you feel the same way about these records becoming available. So. I'm going to start off today, as Ginevra mentioned, talking about the history of Catholics in Massachusetts. And things started off a little rough for Catholics in Massachusetts. The Puritans had a fairly hostile view toward Roman Catholics, whether the Catholics were Irish, French, or any other background. Puritans felt that England hadn't gone far enough when it broke completely from the Catholic Church in the 1500s. They felt the Anglican Church still kept too many practices and rituals that were similar to the Catholic Church. In Massachusetts Bay Colony, while there was a degree of tolerance when it came to some people who were not congregational, this did not extend to Roman Catholics who were not allowed to reside in the colony. In 1700, a law was passed forbidding any Catholic priest from being president in the colony under penalty of life imprisonment. This law stemmed largely from the colonists' fear that French Jesuit priests would convert the Indian tribes of the area. And so it was for for most of the 1700s, then with the arrival of the American Revolution came a desire to have good strategic relations with the French in Canada so they could be of assistance uh, in the war against the British. Therefore, official treatment of Catholics improved. There was still a great deal of prejudice among the people and even some violence against Catholics, but there was more official tolerance of Catholics. During the war, French naval chaplains celebrated mass in Boston on French ships and in barracks and military hospitals. So the people of Boston did have a chance to get more accustomed to the presence of practicing Catholics. A French chaplain remained in Boston after the war to organize a congregation. And the first public mass was celebrated in 1788 in a former Huguenot or French Protestant chapel. By 1790, there were nearly 500 Catholics in Boston, predominantly French and Irish. They held a variety of occupations, merchants, professionals, tradespeople, property owners. Then more Irish started coming to America, inspired by the American and French revolutions and wanting the independence they couldn't get in Ireland under British oppression. In the 1790s, Bishop Carroll of Baltimore, who was the first Catholic bishop in America, 
posted two French priests to Boston who ended up staying for a long period and being critical to the development of the church in Boston. They cooperated well with non-Catholics. They also helped bring peace between the French and Irish Catholics in the community. In 1799, the Boston Catholic Congregation decided to purchase land and build a church since their needs had outgrown the Huguenot Chapel they had been using. An interesting fact is that President John Adams, a non-Catholic, was an early donor to the project and gave $100. Construction of the Church of the Holy Cross was completed in 1803. In 1808, Bishop Carroll of Baltimore was appointed by the Pope as the first American Archbishop, and four dioceses were created, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Bardstown, Kentucky. In 1818, the first Catholic cemetery in Boston was established, so Catholics no longer had to be buried in a variety of other existing burial grounds. By 1825, there were nine dioceses in America, but the number of Boston's churches had not grown, and the diocese was starting to encounter the need for more. In the 1830s, the Irish Catholic population began increasing more rapidly, and many parishioners moved out of the center of town to other neighborhoods like the North End, the South End, and Charlestown, often for work on the waterfront. So parishes were established in those neighborhoods. Some Irish moved out of the city entirely to places like the Merrimack River area and towns like Lowell to pursue work in textile mills and on canal building projects, so parishes were established there. There was an early parish in the town of Salem, a busy port north of Boston, and the priests there would often travel north and provide sacraments to people in areas where there was no parish. So in early records from Salem, we see records of sacraments from a variety of other locations in northern New England. There were also missions to places like Providence, Rhode Island, and St. John, New Brunswick in Canada. Unfortunately, while the Catholic population grew, anti-Catholic sentiment sometimes intensified with it. A major and terrible incident, and one which many Bostonians are still aware of today, was burning of the Ursuline Convent in Charlestown in 1834. It was perpetrated by local non-Catholic members of the working classes who saw Catholic immigrants as potential competitors for jobs. In spite of this kind of sentiment, immigration by Catholics only increased. German Catholics had begun arriving in Massachusetts in the 1820s, largely from the western and northwestern parts of the German states. These immigrants soon began asking for a priest who understood their customs and spoke their language, and the bishop tried to accommodate them with varying degrees of success. In 1844, they got their own church, Holy Trinity, commonly referred to as the German church. When the Great Famine in Ireland began, the community of Boston responded strongly and provided assistance to Ireland, including shipments of food and clothing. But the famine situation only grew worse and the need came for people to emigrate. In 1847 alone, 37,000 Irish immigrants arrived in Boston and just as many went to other American cities. This number is especially incredible when we compare it to previous years when Boston saw the arrival of four or 5,000 immigrants per year. Many of the famine immigrants arrived in poor health and faced difficult living conditions in Boston. Portuguese immigrants, first from the Azores, then from the Cape Verde Islands, and then Portugal itself, began arriving in the 1830s and settling in ports where they could work in such industries as whaling. For a while, beginning in the 1870s, they shared a church in the north end of Boston with Italian immigrants. Immigration by Italian, Polish, and Lithuanian Catholics reached its peak in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Some came simply for opportunity. Some, like Italians in the 1880s, came to flee flood, drought, and disease conditions in their native land. All of these groups are included in the records of the Archdiocese. Now that we know some of the history, let's talk about the project to digitize the Archdiocese records and make them available to researchers. So how did it all start? The Archdiocese had some goals they wanted to address. They knew how valuable the records were to researchers of genealogy and local history and church history, and they wanted to make them more easily accessible. The archive staff, which for a long time numbered just one person, was receiving more than a thousand record requests each year and was finding it hard to keep up and also take care of their many other tasks. 
the physical condition of many of the record volumes was poor with pages becoming brittle and tearing and coming loose from bindings. So the staff wanted to reduce the handling of these volumes to try to preserve the information. So a little more than two years ago, Thomas Lester, the Archdiocese Archivist, called us at the New England Historic Genealogical Society because he was familiar with our organization and the databases we had created on our American Ancestors website. And he asked if we might be able to help with the digitization of the Archdiocese records. We were very excited about this possibility. We, along with many other genealogical researchers, had been hoping for a long time that these records would become available online. So we said yes. It took about a year and a half to get all the details worked out, and then we started the project about a year ago. The records that are included in the project date from 1789 through 1900. This represents a very large number of records. It's possible that in a few years, the Archdiocese and NEHGS will consider including years beyond 1900, but for now we have plenty of records to keep us busy. The Archdiocese uh, covers the geographic area all the way up to the northeast border of Massachusetts as far as places like Salisbury and Lowell, Groton. It goes south down as far as the Middleborough, Plymouth area and west as far as Marlboro. So if you're wondering does the Archdiocese of Boston just include the city of Boston, it certainly does not. It's really most of eastern Massachusetts. The largest portion of records are for baptisms and marriages. However, there are also many records of first communions, confirmations, ordinations, sick calls, and deaths. They don't exist for every single parish or for every single year, but there is a significant number of them. A few parishes also have records of people admitted to the church, and you may also come across accounting records as you are browsing through the volumes. Most of the records are in Latin or English, and there are also quite a few in French, German, or Italian. However, you don't need to speak these languages in order to search the records. I'd like to show you some examples of the records so you can see what they look like and the kinds of information they include. This is a baptism record for a Patrick Bernard McGuire. You can see that his name is given in English in the left margin, but the remainder of the record is in Latin. We see that the day of the baptism just going to get my arrow tool here. You can see that the day of the baptism is the 28th. The month and year are usually found at the top of the page. We have his name. We have the date of his birth, which is the 19th. We have his father's name, his mother's name, and the names of two witnesses. There will also usually be the name of the priest who performed the baptism just down below. In the searchable records, you will see that there is a transcription provided. If you have any trouble reading the original record, you can just look at the transcription. When you're searching, you don't need to enter the Latin form of a person's name to find them. You can see here that we are entering variant forms of a person's name, so you can find people by searching for them with different spellings. Next we have a marriage record. This one is somewhat similar to the baptism record except it's in English. Uh, again we have names in the left margin of the uh, bride and groom and then in the record itself we see of course we have their names again and we also have the names of the two witnesses. And here below is the transcription, so if you have trouble with that handwriting in the original record, you can see what our transcription is. Next I'm going to show you another marriage record uh, to give an example of how the format of all these records can really vary from uh, year to year, from parish to parish. Uh, they were using different volumes and sometimes you may encounter records that are in a column format. So where there is a heading at the top of a column and then information is filled in below. So instead of it being a paragraph, you have rows and columns. So this again is a marriage record and we have the date, 
we have the name of the groom, we have the name of the bride, and so forth. All the information is really pretty similar to what you would see in the other marriage record. Sometimes further over to the right, there might be a note uh, column, in which case some additional information might be added about the people uh, involved with that sacrament. So that can be interesting sometimes. And again, just like with all the other records, there's a transcription. With records like confirmation records and first communion records, sometimes the information can be more minimal. Uh, they won't necessarily list the names of the parents. They might just list the names of the uh, children who were uh, who had their first communion or who were having their confirmation. So as you can see here, it's just a list of names. Up above, we have the year we have the church where it took place. In records for deaths or funerals or burials, it can vary. Uh, sometimes it's about a funeral, sometimes it's just a, a, about a burial or a death. Um, information can include things like the name of the person who died. Uh, in this case, we see that up above, this is the date of the funeral, August 21st, and then there's the date of death, which was the 20th. And again, we see the name of the priest signature almost always. Sometimes you might get a little more information, like in this example for Thomas Burke, where it says that he died on the 12th in the almshouse. But the death records, they also tend to be somewhat minimal compared to records like baptisms and marriages. Now I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of how these records can vary. So here we see an earlier example from the 1830s where everything is handwritten. Um, it may, depending on your experience, it may or may not be handwriting that you're accustomed to seeing. And uh, so it's all just written out in a paragraph form. Then as we get into the latter part of the 19th century, you will start to see records that are in this format, which is using a pre-printed form. So the priest didn't have to keep writing some of the same information over and over that applied uh, in every situation. So uh, these can be a little bit easier to read because you can see what the uh, sort of boilerplate template part is and then what is the part that is specific to the people you're interested in researching. So how does our project work? Just briefly, I'll talk about that process. Uh, we receive volumes here at NEHGS in batches. Uh, they're brought over, we then have to evaluate them. We are trying to do them uh, earlier to later, but we have been mixing that up a little bit and trying to include some later records. Some of it depends upon the condition of the volumes, and that's one of the things we evaluate when the volumes arrive. So they may need conservation before they can be scanned. It may be that they have pages that are coming loose or are tearing, and we simply can't handle them in a scanning situation uh, because we worry about tearing the pages and causing any loss of information. So some of the volumes go to our conservation lab where they have some treatment done for them so they can be uh, put into a condition where we can scan them. Then they are scanned by our volunteers and staff, and then they go to indexers. And we have volunteer indexers, and we also have a vendor who does indexing. And what they do is they have an image, as you can see here in the lower photo, they have an image of the original record, and then they also have a spreadsheet open where they are entering in all the various pieces of information that we want, like first name and last name and type of record and date and witnesses. And witnesses are something that are special in this project. Um, when you use Catholic records on a lot of websites, you may not have access to this information, but we're making it searchable on American Ancestors, which is something we're excited about. And our wonderful uh, volunteers and other indexers are doing a great job making their way through what can sometimes be difficult handwriting and can be languages like Latin and German. Um, and they're doing a terrific job at providing us with an index that makes it possible for people to search. So we're very grateful to them. So what exactly does this project include? 
Uh, there are 84 towns represented so far. It's possible there, there could be more by the time we're done as the archivist continues gathering records. Uh, right now, there are 288 parishes in the archdiocese and there are 154 parishes included in this project. So some parishes developed after 1900 and that's why they're not in here. We could, just like with the number of towns, we could end up with more parishes by the time we're done. We have about 937 volumes to scan and transcribe in this project and it comes out to approximately 400,000 pages to go through and we estimate that there will be approximately 10 million names indexed by the time we're done. So once those indexers have done their work uh, in transcribing the records, it becomes a searchable database. But even before then, we take the images that have been scanned and we immediately, as soon as a parish is completed with scanning, we put it on the website so that you can go on and browse through those images of records. You don't have to wait until the indexing is done and a searchable uh, database is created. So when you want to go use the records, whether they're just image only or searchable, you can go to catholicrecords.americanancestors.org as one way of getting to the records. On that website, you'll find a variety of things, including a timeline and map of the church. And this is very helpful. And I think it also addresses some of the questions that I saw some of you sent in before the webinar, which is, so which parishes are included and where are they and what are the dates? When you uh, use this map and you click on a year, you'll be able to see parishes pop up and then you can click on the parish and get a little more information about when it was established and things like that. So it's a really great way to sort of uh, get oriented in terms of, you know, what does the archdiocese include, which parishes are in this project and, you know, when did they come about. You can also get information on what the sacraments are and then you'll see there's that uh, in that big green area, you can sign up free to see the parish records. So that's one way uh, to get to the records but there are other ways as well. If you just go to our website, AmericanAncestors.org, and you go to the Browse menu and drop that down, you'll see that the first option is Database List A to Z. So you can go there. And then you'll be able to use this search by database name. And that means you can put in a, a keyword from the title of the database. And so I've entered the term Catholic, which is the way I usually get to these because right away, the first two things that come up are the archdiocese databases. The first one is the searchable version. The second one is the image only. Right now, the image only one is larger because we have more volumes scanned than we have searchable. So, but you'll see both of them appear right at the top. So let's talk about browsing the image only parishes. The image only database is free for anyone to use. All you have to do is set up your guest account and then you're free to go and browse through and look at all the images and that's the way it will be, not just on a temporary basis, it will continue to be that way. So we're looking again at that database list A to Z. Um, I've circled here that image only database, that's the browsable database, and you'll see that to the left of that is a camera icon, and that's the quickest way to jump right in and start browsing through the volumes. When we do that, we're brought right into the first page for the first parish. Uh, this is Holy Cross. This drop-down volume menu that I'm pointing to here, uh, that drops down to show you all the parishes that are included in this database, and all the different volumes, so you can, you can jump around and select which ones you want to go to. There, for each uh, volume, there's an introductory page, just like the one that you see here. And if there's an index for that volume, you know, many of the volumes do have indexes that were done by the archdiocese over the years. If there is such a thing, then there'll be a guide to the index. And this is something that we created here at NEHGS so that you could quickly get to the part of the index you want. 
So you can see here I've enlarged a section about the uh, index to the grooms in marriages. So let's say we were looking for someone with a last name beginning with C, we'd be able to see what part of the index that was in. And then up here in this page section, we could just type in the number and, jump, and then hit enter and jump right to that page. So that's what I've done here, and I've gotten to page 221, and I was looking for Edward Carroll, and here I find him, and it also tells me the volume and the page that he can be, that his record can be found on. So then I'll be able to drop down the volume menu and choose that volume. So here, that's what I've done, drop down the menu, and down there highlighted, you'll see I've chosen Holy Cross Marriages, Volume 8, 1844 to 1856. Once I've done that, I can enter that page I was given, which was 56, and it takes me right here to this page, and as I scroll down, I can see here is Edward Carroll and his marriage record. So that's how you navigate your way through the browsing of the records. There's not always an index, so sometimes you are just going to have to look through based upon the approximate year you might know uh, for when you think your ancestor got married or was baptized. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's somewhat similar to using microfilm, which many of you might have done. Uh, you're looking through, you, you have an idea perhaps of the parish where uh, your ancestor uh, attended. Uh, maybe you know that because of the neighborhood where they lived. So you have an idea of which parish to go to, and then you can, you may have to browse through some years and look for the record un until that parish is searchable, that is. And once it's searchable, that makes your work a lot easier. And that's what we're going to move on to next, the searchable parishes. So the way you search is you choose from that database list the first database. And to the left of it, you'll see there's a magnifying glass, and that's how you jump right into searching the database. So here we are. This is the database search page, and you're going to see that there are lots of fields. I would recommend that you do not enter information in all these fields, no matter what database you're using on the website. You probably never want to fill in all of these boxes. You really want to start with just a few pieces of information. So you may just want to enter a first name and last name. Maybe you want to enter a range of years, maybe a record type. There is a volume drop-down menu, uh, which will list for you the uh, parishes and volumes that are included in that database. You may or may not, I would suggest starting off, you may not want to choose that, especially right now, it's not a, a, a huge database, so you might just want to search across all of it. And then down below, we have family members, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So here is a search I've entered. I've entered the first name, Edward, last name, Carol, and then I've chosen a record type. I've chosen marriage. Here is just to show you that you could choose the parish and volume from that volume drop-down menu. I'm not going to do that here, but just so you see that that's an option. I'm just going to click the search button and away we go. So here we are and we see we have a few different results. There are five results for Edward Carroll, a marriage. And that first one is the, the same one we were looking at before. And you'll notice below that there are some others. Uh, you'll see in the second example, well, there's one that has both a Latin and English name because the original was in Latin. So uh, it's made available. And you can scroll down and see that there are more. It also shows you that there is a surname Crowley. Uh, we do bring up variant surnames uh, in your results. It's if, if you don't want to see variant surnames, there's an option on the search page just to do an exact search. But sometimes it can be helpful to have those included, uh, especially with, with these archdiocese records when you, you may not be sure how uh, the last name was spelled. 
So we click on the person's name to see the original record. And here it is, it shows us the full page. We'll probably want to zoom in, so you can't see them too well here. They're more pronounced when you're actually using this yourself. But up in the upper right, there is the plus sign and the minus sign for zooming in and out. And you'll make good use of those. You can also scroll using your mouse and zoom in and out. So you can get in really close with the record. And there's really good resolution on the image. So even when it's enlarged, you can read it nice and clearly. And that should help you as you try to decipher the record. So let's say you want to search in combination with a spouse, a parent, or a witness. You may find this especially useful if you're doing Irish research. I can speak from painful experience when you are searching for a really common name like Patrick McGuire or like James Doyle. And let's say that person even married someone with a really common name like Anne Donahue. Well, sometimes you need to combine names in order to narrow the results. And as this database gets bigger and bigger, this is going to become even more useful. So in this case, um, I've decided to combine the name James Doyle with a search for a witness. And when you're doing research, you will discover that there are sometimes these collateral families, and it could be a relative, it could be an in-law, um, or it could be a neighbor, just you know, a family that they were acquainted with. And so as you're doing research, you become familiar with some of these surnames. So I'm entering down below the surname Gilman. It's a slightly more unusual surname than Doyle. And I wanna see, well, maybe one of the Gilmans was a witness at a sacrament for James Doyle. So I enter that in, I say, for my type over on the left, I just say any. You could choose father, mother, spouse, but if you wanna include witnesses or fathers, mothers, spouses, then just choose any and it keeps it a little more broad. So we'll click search. And it brings up just one result. Um, so that's great. So we can see here, we have James Doyle. We can see here's his spouse, Anne Donahue. And there's that witness, Stephen Gilman. So it's just a nice way to uh, narrow the number of results that you get. So you're probably wondering, what's available now? Which parishes can I access? So let's talk about that. So the parishes that are now available for browsing and searching, so you can look at them either way, our Cathedral of the Holy Cross, which is the biggest, it's the oldest and the biggest, and I'm not going to read to you everything that's on these slides in terms of the types of records and the years, but just to give you a sense of the various kinds of records and years that exist, there you can see what's available for Holy Cross. Like I say, we don't put anything up until the parish is complete. So what you see here, that's everything that exists for the parish um, during those years. Uh, Immaculate Conception, which is in the south end of Boston, Sacred Heart, which is in Roslindale, and also for browsing and searching, you can use St. Cecilia, which is in the back bay of Boston, St. Joseph in Boston, and there are also two missions. I mentioned these before, and the records are included, the Providence, Rhode Island mission, and the St. John, New Brunswick mission. They're really very interesting early records. The parishes that are available for browsing are more numerous. We have more of these up. As I say, as soon as we complete the scanning, they go up for you to view. And then they're kept there even when a searchable version becomes available. So you'll find it in both the searchable and the browsable databases eventually. Uh, so Holy Trinity in Boston, that's that German church I was talking about. Our Lady of Victories in Boston. Immaculate Conception in Salem. I mentioned that Salem was one of the early places where there was a parish. So there are several parishes from Salem and Immaculate Conception is one that is available for browsing now. Sacred Heart, which is in the north end of Boston. Sacred Heart of Jesus in Cambridge. St. James the Greater in Boston. St. Mary in Charlestown, another Salem Parish, St. Mary, and a St. Mary in Waltham, which just recently went up. And lastly, St. Teresa of Avila in West Roxbury.
So these all these parishes represent a variety of dates and a variety of ethnic groups as well. For example, the church in the North End would include quite a few Italian immigrants and Holy Trinity would include German immigrants. So what is up already is representative of the diversity of the archdiocese in terms of both years and in terms of the communities involved. What's coming next? So the parishes that are coming soon, for browsing, you will soon see St. George in Framingham and St. Patrick in Natick. These are communities that are west of Boston. And for searching, we will soon have Sacred Heart of Jesus in Cambridge. So one difference to point out between the two versions, and this is a question I know came up quite a bit uh, that people sent in ahead of the webinar. Again, the browsable version, free to anybody. The searchable versions are for any HGS members. So for those, you do need to have a paid membership. And that's, you know, pretty much just because of the work that goes into creating those searchable databases and those indexes. So browsable, free, searchable for any HGS members. How do you get updates? There are a couple of different ways you can get updates on this. One is to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. If you don't already receive it, the Weekly Genealogist. If you go onto our website, American Ancestors, and just go to the bottom of any page, you're going to see, like I've circled here, this button that says sign up for our e-newsletter. You can go to that and you can sign up. This is very popular. Uh, readers really enjoy the e-newsletter anyway, but as it happens, you could also get news about about updates to the archdiocese databases as well as all our other databases. Something new that we have just as of a few months ago is database news. So with this, if you just go to our search page right above the search form, you'll see this link that says get instantly notified when we add new data to our collections and sign up now. And what that enables you to do is to receive information about a new database as soon as it has been added. So as soon as it goes up, our wonderful website team sends this out to everyone so you can see what's there and you can immediately go and start browsing or searching it. If you would like to get involved, we have a couple of different ways in which you can do that. You can take our transcription challenge. So in that database news that I just mentioned, which is an email that comes to you if you sign up for it, Sometimes we include in there transcription challenges from the archdiocese records and we'll include records that have been particularly difficult for us to decipher. And we will ask for your input and maybe you'll want to put your uh, transcription skills to the test and see what you can do. And we've had a great response to this and people send, you know, they comment there on the web page that this links to and they give their best guess as to what the handwriting says. And then Later, we let you know which transcriptions we chose and have gone into the, the searchable database. So that's one way in which you can get involved and help us out. You can also help support the work of the project by making a financial contribution on that catholicrecords.americanancestors.org page. There is a link to support this project. It takes you to the web page that you see here on the right where you can learn more about what that means to contribute and you can give. And we also ask just that you spread the word about these databases so that people who have a need to do research of people who would be included in the archdiocese records know that these databases exist. We really want to get the word out. Like I say, it's been a long time. We've been waiting for the records to become available online. So we want to make sure everyone knows about it. So Ginevra mentioned uh, early on that we have a new subject guide on our website. This was created by one of the genealogists on our library staff, Jean Belmonte. It's New England Catholic Church Records. So after this webinar, if you find that you have more questions about Catholic Church Records in New England, you might want to check out that subject guide. You find it, there's a URL listed here. You also can drop down this education menu and choose learning resources and it will be under the read section of learning resources, meaning you can read the subject guide. All right. 
Thank you, Jean, for your presentation. So now let's tackle any questions that you may have. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to has, ask, go ahead and type it in the questions panel on the right of your screen, and Jean will try to answer as many as she can in the time provided. And I know that there are a lot of questions, so we may not get to all of them today. Um, so we have a few questions about what, you know, is this church included? Is this parish included? Is this uh, location part of the Boston um, Archdiocese. Could you, I know you mentioned this earlier in the uh, presentation, but could you again kind of clarify what geographic area does the project cover? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Uh, like I say, there often is confusion because it's called the Archdiocese of Boston, so sometimes people think it's just the city, or sometimes the confusion goes the other way and people think it's all of Massachusetts. So it's neither of those things. It's really most of Eastern Massachusetts. So again, that extends up to the Northeastern border of the state with New Hampshire. So towns like Salisbury and Lowell and Groton, Haverhill, all these places along the way, that's, that's all included. Then it goes down south, so you know, of course, covers all areas of Boston, but then goes down south to areas like Middleborough and Plymouth. And then it goes as far west as about uh, Marlboro and Hopkinton. So it's really the eastern portion of the state. However, uh, as I'm uh, mentioned in the description for this webinar, there are records that go beyond that simply because the priests in the parishes early on were traveling around and not in, for all the parishes, but for some of the parishes especially, priests were traveling around. So they would go to places like New Hampshire and Maine or Rhode Island, and there will be records for those people. So if you're talking about early years, um, you know, say the late 1700s and the early half of the 1800s, you will want to check the Archdiocese of Boston records if you're looking for someone who was in the area that is now Maine or, or it was New Hampshire or Rhode Island and even places like New Brunswick, Canada, because it's possible they were included in there just because the priests had to cover uh, a, a larger area. There just weren't so many parishes around. So the Archdiocese today officially is that area that I described before, but for the early records, you will find records from places beyond Eastern Massachusetts. And it looks like we have a few questions about um, churches and parishes that are no longer in existence. So, um, you know, the churches are, are closed. Would those records um, possibly be included in this project? The answer is yes. Uh, the closed parishes, also sometimes referred to as suppressed parishes, those records are included. So it doesn't matter whether the uh, church was closed or not. Uh, the records for that parish would be included in the project as long as they date from 1900 or earlier. All right, and a question about that year 1900. Um, would you include records uh, for 1900 or is it kind of just before uh, the turn of the century? Good question. Yes, 1900 is included. So it's through December 31st, 1900. All right, and also a number of questions about do we have plans to work with other states, other um, archdioceses um, throughout New England, if you want to tackle that one. So first, I want to alert people to some other projects that are going on, because I think many people have still not heard about these. But the um, Archdiocese of Philadelphia, New York, and Baltimore are working with the website findmypast.com to put their records online. So that just started a few months ago, and they've done some Philadelphia parishes. I think the project still has a ways to go, but it's very exciting that those archdioceses have decided to make their records available online. So that's going to be a big help to genealogical researchers everywhere. Uh, so please be aware of that project happening. It, again, it's something you'll need to keep checking back on uh, with By My Past to try to see how it develops and see how the parishes grow. So beyond that, I am sure that other archdioceses are going to want to do the same thing now that they see it happening successfully with others. So we are always willing to talk to any diocese or archdiocese uh, who 
just wants advice, wants help, maybe wants us to do it for them, uh, will be working on the Archdiocese of Boston for the next few years, but we're very happy to talk to other archdioceses. As far as other dioceses in Massachusetts, so like Fall River, Springfield, Worcester, those are not part of this project. Um, so those would be separate projects. And we have a few questions actually about um, Acadians. So French, you know, uh, Catholic Acadians who wind up in Massachusetts before 1789 when, of course, the project starts. Um, are there any resources available um, that kind of track um, Acadians in Massachusetts prior to 1789 that you're aware of? Well, there are a lot of resources about Acadians, that's for sure. And we have a lot of resources right here in our library. So a place to start might be to go to our library catalog, which is library.nehgs.org and search for Acadian uh, as your keyword. And so that's one place so you can start to see some of the many books that have been done on that subject, uh, reference books, directories, guides, that sort of thing. Uh, in terms of them in the archdiocese records, of course, they're just, you know, um, if folks 1789 and later, including folks who came down from uh, Canada, are included, of course, along with everyone else. But in terms of Acadian resources, I would start by searching our, our library catalog. Great. Uh, and Patty asks, um, would any of the records that we're digitizing, would they show where a parent may have been born? And beyond just kind of the country, but perhaps giving some more specific information as to the parent's origins. Yes, that's an excellent question. And what we have found is that you will sometimes find information about a town and county of origin in the early records. So for example, one of the volunteers working on our German records, the Holy Trinity records recently was telling me that in the earlier Holy Trinity records, he's more apt to see some information about the uh, area where that person came from in the German states. As the records get later, that information seems to disappear. And sometimes that could be because, you know, people just aren't thinking, you know, this isn't an immigrant who's receiving the sacrament and they're just not thinking about place of origin or, you know, it just became a matter of not recording so much information as time went on. So in terms of parents, origins of parents, mm, you know, not a lot, um, but sometimes. and in terms of origins of the person or persons actually receiving that sacrament, yes, sometimes. All right, and we also have several questions about kind of a timeline <laughs> as far as when certain parishes are gonna be available. Um, do we have a master plan? Um, can you share that with everyone? Or maybe you can talk about how certain parishes are prioritized and how those uh, kind of talk about the order in which they they go up on the website. Yes, we do have a master plan, but we do not assign a date to a parish ever because every parish has its own unique situation. And as I mentioned before, part of that is the physical condition of the volumes. That is a really big factor in terms of when a volume will get online. Uh, if we have to perform some treatment on the volume, then it's it's not going to go up as soon as something else. So that's one thing uh, that happens. And then another thing that factors into it is, well, you know, in terms of making it searchable, how difficult is it to index? You know, is it in a language other than English? Is the handwriting difficult to read? So if it's something that's going to take our indexers more time, well then that's what's going to happen. Sometimes you don't really find out until you dive into the records. Uh, it, even in the life of a parish, there are many priests, they have different handwriting, there are different languages used some, with some of the parishes through the life of that parish. So it's really once we dive in that we find out. So as I mentioned, before it, really the best way to stay on top of it is to get that database news alert uh, or to read the weekly genealogist because you're going to find out right away. We certainly don't uh, wait and sit around before we tell you that something's available. We tell you right away. Um, and in terms of how we prioritize, so we definitely wanted to make Holy Cross first. It's 
the largest and the oldest. So we knew that we wanted to get that one online first, and that's what we did. And we continued to uh, always be working on an early parish. And what we've also done is at the same time work on some of the parishes from the latter part of the 19th century. And that's for several reasons. Um, one is, so for those folks who are researching people from later years or from other ethnic groups, would have uh, records that they can search online, but it's also a conservation issue. So we find that volumes from the latter part of the 19th century are generally in better condition than those from the early part of the 19th century. So we can do those a little faster. We also factor in some requests that we get from people. If we if we really hear a lot uh, from people about a particular parish, and if it's a parish that we can do, you know, conservation wise and in terms of indexing, we'll certainly try to do that as fast as we can if we know that there is significant demand for that parish. All right, and um, a number of questions about um, records after 1900. Um, is there any kind of discussion about um, furthering that um, kind of the availability of records uh, past um, or more recent than 19, the year 1900? Um, and if people have, you know, ancestors from say, you know, after 1900 that they want to look at, how do they go about uh, finding those records? Yes, so right now we have no plans to do beyond 1900. So in a few years from now, um, the Archdiocese and NEHGS will see how things are and we'll see if we want to do more. Um, so it's very possible that that could happen and that we'll have records beyond 1900. Right now, if you are researching an ancestor from that time period, then you will need to contact the Archdiocese archives and they're very helpful. Um, you can email them. And in fact, the, a good thing to do now is to, you know, for your earlier research needs from earlier years, use the online version and then save your questions relating to records after 1900 for the archivist. And, and you can email them and they will uh, send you a transcription of a record. So that service continues to be offered by the Archdiocese Archives. And um, a question from Wayne, he asks, so if you have a civil record, what new information might you find in these records that you wouldn't necessarily find in a civil record? Good question. So one of the things is that you might find a record where there isn't a civil record. So just for starters, um, you uh, may have trouble finding folks in civil records and so this is just another place to come and that did that did happen a bit it it can also go the other way but we find that there were especially you know i think with immigrants as they first arrived you know maybe there, there wasn't always a civil record uh created but there might be one for the sacrament because the church was so central to their life their parish their community was so important to them so the information that might be in there would be different. Well, of course, there is information about the sacrament itself, which wouldn't be in a civil record. So if it's a baptism, you have both the date of the birth and the date of the baptism. So that might tell you something. You, it might be interesting to see how far apart are those dates. And then also, you'll get information about witnesses. So that's some of the additional information you find. And also, you, we find that just, um, especially with the early records, there can be information about the event itself or the priest will go back later and they'll add a note. So like say someone who was baptized in the parish later, they get married, they'll go back and add a note to that baptism saying so-and-so got married in such and such a year. So, um, you know, they're, they're handwritten records by someone who was very involved in the life of the church. And so it will uh, have additional information often. All right, and just a few more questions. Um, let's see, we have a number of inquiries about Catholic cemeteries. Um, is that part of this project? Um, if not, how might someone go about uh, finding the records for Catholic cemeteries? That's another great question. Uh, 
on the whole, no, cemeteries are not included in this project. And that's because the Archdiocese Archives doesn't have uh, most of the cemetery records. They're, they tend to be held locally. So there are some, uh, as I showed in the presentation, some funeral, death, burial records. So those do, do exist for some parishes in the Archdiocese Archives. But um, on the whole, most cemetery information is held locally. And so you need to get in touch with the local parish to uh, determine the availability of those records. All right, and let's see a few other questions here. Um, so do we have a few questions about just, do we have a list on our website of all the parishes or churches that um, that are covered by the project? Well, if you go to the Archdiocese of Boston website, they have a very helpful list. It's a chronological list of the establishment of parishes in the archdiocese and so there you can see what would be in what would be covered by 1789 through 1900 so that's one way to look you can just look at any chronological list of the parishes in the archdiocese and you're so you'll be able to see what's included um, so we haven't made a whole list. There, there are additional parishes that come into it as i mentioned the Archdiocese archivist continues to gather records from parishes. So he keeps sending us new versions of the list. So the really the best place to go is the Archdiocese website so that you can get familiar with the parishes and when they formed. And of course, when you're when you go to browse, there's that volume drop down. And that's another way to just very quickly look and see all of the parishes that are currently available for uh, browsing. Great, and uh, we also had a few questions about the Boston, the pilot, um, which was a newspaper, which is a newspaper um, for the Archdiocese of Boston. Uh, can you talk about um, that as a resource and how you would go about researching um, or you know searching those uh, those issues? I'm so glad you asked about this because I saw in the pre-webinar questions that there were some people who asked, would this be digitized? And in fact, it's already been digitized uh, years ago. So I really wanna let people know about this. This is on American Ancestors. There's a database called Boston Pilot, Irish Immigrant Advertisements, 1831 to 1920. And those advertisements were put in by people, definitely not just in the Boston area, all over the country, who were looking for their so-called missing friends. We call it the search for missing friends. Um, people were looking for relatives or acquaintances that they didn't know where they'd ended up. You know, they'd emigrated. They weren't really sure where those people ended up. So these are incredibly useful advertisements, and it is available as a searchable database on American ancestors. And again, it's called Boston Pilot. Irish Immigrant Advertisements, 1831 to 1920. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Jean. We're going to have to uh, cut it off there. But if you would like more help with the specifics of your research project, um, you, you might need some more help either with your Catholic ancestors or uh, your your family your family history research in general, uh, you might want to consider scheduling a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an expert at NEHGS. And to do so, you can just write to consultations at nehgs.org. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on this presentation. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.